Well, thank you all, and uh, you know, thank you again to the uh, conference organizers for giving us the coveted after lunch. Uh, you know, it's a, a speaking presentation. While you all are trying to digest your meals, you know, we've got a great panel discussion here uh, on uh, changing oil and gas company investment. For those of you who I don't know, I'm Mark Finley. Uh, I'm a fellow in energy and global oil at Rice University's Center for Energy Studies. And you are not here to hear me speak, and so I won't take up much of your time. Um, you know, the panel that we're looking at today, uh, in the context of an overall conference, uh, that is looking at energy transitions in the 21st century. I think it's uh, you know, beyond debate that we need to continue to pay attention to oil and gas even in the, in the midst of an energy transition that we all aspire to. Uh, why? Well, because today it's the majority of the molecules that get us to work and feed our kids, etc. You know, today oil is the dominant source of energy in the world, as it has been for the last 50 years. About one third of all of the world's primary energy consumption is in the form of oil today. Natural gas accounts for about 25% of the world's energy consumption, uh, making it the number three fuel after coal. Here in the United States, the shares are even bigger. Oil is 40% of US domestic energy consumption, and natural gas is 30%. Those numbers are bigger than the global averages, by the way, because of the smaller role of coal in the US energy system, uh, not because of any reduced reliance on uh, renewables and other non-fossil forms of energy. Um, moreover, as we will hear from several of our esteemed panelists, even in a scenario that successfully deals with an energy transition to a lower carbon future, we will continue to need trillions of dollars of new investment in future oil and gas supply uh, to meet the, the future demand trajectory, whatever that trajectory may be. Uh, and we've just built an esteemed panel here to help us noodle through how oil and gas companies are thinking about this investment paradigm in the face of an energy transition. How are changing views on prices, technology, policy, and geopolitics coloring uh, investment decision making? And importantly, what does that investment decision making changes mean for the supply outlook for oil and natural gas? So our panelists, I won't go through lengthy introductions. Their, introduction, their bios are in the conference pack. But we've got uh, Chris Birdsall is the manager of economics and energy in the corporate strategic planning department at ExxonMobil. Uh, his team produces ExxonMobil's annual long-term energy outlook. Mark Berg, ex executive vice president for corporate and vertically integrated operations at Pioneer Natural Resources. And Paramagnus Nicefeen, a senior partner and founding partner of Rystad Energy. Um, and the way we're going to organize this conversation today is Chris will lead us off with a high level perspective based on the ExxonMobil energy outlook of the world of energy and what ExxonMobil is doing in response to that. Um, Mark will lead us through a deep dive uh, in the shale patch and in particular in the Permian, where, where Pioneer has a leading position. Uh, and then Pear, will, Pear Magnus will help us draw the lens back out to the global picture of investment and its implications for the supply picture. Hopefully we can do all that and keep on time, which is my main job here today. Um, I would ask the, uh, the audience to hold your questions until all of the presenters are finished and then we'll do them all at the end of the conversation. Uh, so hopefully that will uh, lead to a, a productive exchange and I'm looking forward to it. Chris, would you like to uh, start us off? Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. So as Mark mentioned, you know, part of my role, I'll share with you what's ExxonMobil's view on changing oil and gas investment. But part of my role on the panel is also to help set up the demand story, because obviously we're putting an investment where we think future demand will be as an industry. And so I'll start with this one page, which is it's kind of the culmination of our energy outlook process, which is how do we think about the various uh, energy sources going out to, to 2040? Obviously, we could spend probably an hour and a half panel just on the trends and drivers here. So I'll just try to, to briefly go through this. You know, for oil, you see you know, pretty strong growth continued out into the next decade and then eventually plateauing off towards the end of this period. You know, the key drivers there, when we think about the transportation sector, Continued efficiency improvements in internal combustion engines and the electrification of light duty transportation and actually efficiency improvements is a bigger driver. Uh, then the commercial transportation, uh, you know, aviation, marine, rail, heavy duty trucking, and then chemicals, feedstocks into chemicals is a big contributor to that liquids growth. After that, you see the, the trends for coal and natural gas and, you know, we 
in our projections, we do believe that coal globally has peaked. Now, now certainly that, that will uh, depend on the, the geopolitics of energy trade. I think if some of the developing Asian nations continue to be concerned about energy security and will countries be free and, and open with their trade, that, that could cause more domestic use of coal there. But overall, our projection is that coal is now declining and natural gas is growing will become the second largest energy source. The trends there are into power generation, especially to help manage intermittency and peaking load, and then natural gas into industrial uses where it's a, it's a cleaner burning uh, source of high intense process heat. Uh, then jumping down to the bottom, you see wind and solar. In our projections for electricity, we, we actually do project that wind and solar will be the fastest source of electricity growth globally. Uh, but of course, when you step back and look at the total, total energy system, it is starting from a small base that even with that aggressive growth, it still looks pretty small at the bottom. But those are some pretty big growth rates there. Above that, nuclear. Uh, <laughs> Nuclear, I'll tell you, if you go back and look at the historical Exxon Mobil energy outlook projections, we have consistently over-projected nuclear. Uh, you know, it's, it seems that, especially in some of the, the developed nations, that the, the general populace and policymakers are just, they're, they're pushing back on nuclear. Uh, so we have trimmed that back a bit. So most of the nuclear growth we show here is in uh, China and India. About 90% of the nuclear growth we project are in those two countries. And then just the other trend I want to mention on this slide is the dotted line for electricity. Now, we, we know electricity is not a primary energy source, which is why I showed it as a dotted line here. But I like to show this for perspective because electricity, compared to the total energy system, electricity is growing about twice as fast, a little bit more than twice as fast. Um, and so this is the trend of the electrification we've heard about in many of the panels uh, over the last few days. And I highlight that because you, you look at some of the big uh, integrated oil companies moving further down the value chain into electricity generation, and this is clearly uh, one of the trends why. So then just looking at the energy mix uh, kind of today out to 2040, you know, as Mark alluded to, oil and gas is still a really big part of the energy mix. Now this is what we call our base case outlook. This is you know, current trends in policy, uh, current trends in technology. Um, I'll talk about, well, what, what could this look like in a two degree C world and make that comparison here. So here in the, the light blue line, this is the emissions from the, the energy outlook projections I just quickly went through on the fuel side, and then it compares it to the results from the 27th uh, Energy Modeling Forum uh, that looked at the, the emission lines up top. Those are kind of base case, no policy changes, but technology continues to improve. And then the, the bottom lines represent the, the 27th Energy Modeling Forums pathways to a two degree C world. Again, full technology, so deploying every technology. And if you're, you're not familiar with the Energy Modeling Forum, um, you know, it is a, it's, it's supported by Stanford University. They bring climate and energy models from all over the world. And therefore, you, know, you do get different perspectives on how the world could play out. And that's why you see so many different pathways on how the world could get to a two degree C stabilization target. So you see our projections in, in the, the light blue, uh, while our projections do show we believe the world in aggregate will meet the, the Paris agreements, and the key word there is in aggregate, because there will clearly be countries that are behind, others that are ahead. But you can see our projection is that the world is not yet on a pathway to a two degree C stabilization target. Again, we could have an entire panel on all the reasons for, for why that is. Uh, but one of the key reasons that, that we believe is that the world does not yet have all of the technology solutions yet to drive an economic transition. Because ultimately, if you look at the launch of those two degree C pathways, the world has to get to net zero and even negative emissions in some of these trends you know, some, sometime in the, the second half of, of the century. And you know, it's, it's kind of a tough pill to swallow to say, wow, we don't, we don't feel like we have all the, the technology solutions yet. So one, one way to look at this, I, I like to use this plot, which is just simply energy and industry-related emissions back in 2017 for the different sectors split OECD, non-OECD. And what I like to do is just have a conversation on, okay, where, where do we have solutions? Because there are some things that are working well. Uh, EVs for light duty transportation, that technology continues to improve. It's on a trajectory um, that will, will definitely uh, create um, a large emissions reduction opportunities in light duty transportation. But in our views, even projecting forward how we think that technology will evolve and improve, we don't think it'll be sufficient for long, uh, long haul heavy duty trucking or, e or even aviation. 
On the right side, I, I've been to a number of sessions that um, the last days that, that talk about decarbonization electricity sector. Absolutely, you know, wind and solar. I mentioned before in our projections, fastest growing source of electricity generation. But then ultimately, as we all know, you get to a point where. Uh, the intermittency becomes more and more of a challenge, and we need other technology solutions to, to help address the intermittency. And then the one that, I, honestly, I have not heard any discussion about in, in the time I've been at the conference, and I recognize I haven't been to every session, but the industrial sector. You know, the industrial sector, which represents the, the, the basic materials of our economy, the, the concrete, the steel, the glass, the plastics. And those are going to be much more challenging to decarbonize, but you can see it, it's, a, it's a large source of uh, global emissions today. So when we share the energy outlook, we actually share this table, which is as we've done our own research work and, and leveraging the uh, energy modeling forum work, we kind of listed what are five areas that the world needs a breakthrough on. Um, and I'm highlighting all this because when, when people ask me, well, what's ExxonMobil investing in, the, the first thing I talked about was, well, let's talk about technology and, and what are the technology solutions that are potentially needed to help drive the world into a two degree C pathway. So, so based on those kind of five areas, what is ExxonMobil doing about that? You know, I think this is where we differentiate ourselves a little bit from our, our IOC um, competitors in that we have always maintained a very large uh, research capability um, at our corporate strategic research, and we're working in areas that are completely outside of our natural value chains today. Um, so a couple things that we have uh, announced very publicly. In transportation, more, more in the, the areas that will be harder to decarbonize, looking at advanced biofuels. And, and we're, we're pursuing two routes because you know, we're not sure w which route will ultimately uh, be the best, but algae-based biofuels and cellulosic biofuels. Um, in, in the area of power generation, uh, you know, we do believe that carbon capture and storage is going to be very important at some point, especially when we're talking about how do we decarbonize that last, you know, I don't know if it's 20 to 30 percent, uh, and do that in a more economic way, especially with uh, developed nations pushing back on nuclear. So we believe carbon capture is going to be a really important part of the mix, and we don't believe that the technology, at least the amine-based technology, is kind of ready for prime time to scale globally at the economics that are needed, so, so pushing research there. And then in the industrial sector, you know, looking at ways that we can lower our own emissions processes with what we call process intensification. You know, so we, we all know that many of the refineries and chemical plants were, were built at, at a different time in the world. And yeah, we always try to do heat integration as, as a way to drive energy efficiency. But I think starting with a clean sheet of paper, there's lots of different ways um, that we could design our manufacturing processes. So we're putting a lot of work there. So I just wanted to share that because you know, one of the big things that, that we've been talking about as ExxonMobil, again, is the world does not yet have all the technology solutions that we need to drive an economic transition to a two degree C world. And this is where kind of we're putting our research dollars to help solve that. Now, I showed you the emissions trends before for the Energy Modeling Forum work. Uh, what I want to show you now is the, the broad range of projections on what the energy mix could look like in 2040 in these two degrees C pathways. So each of these represents another of the models that participated. And on the far left, I do show the IEA sustainable development scenario because we get asked about that quite a bit. So first, you know, one of the things that jumps off the page is if you just look at what's the total energy that's projected in 2040, really wide range. And it just, I mean, it goes to the uncertainty and what energy modelers have to deal with all the time. Um, there are some models that have lower projections of GDP. They have much uh, stronger assumptions on energy efficiency, which dramatically brings down energy consumption. There are other models that, that show growth um, even from today. So that, that's one thing that's different. And then just the other thing to highlight, I want to highlight on this page is, if you look at the green, which represents oil, and the red, which represents natural gas, and then also the shaded red, which represents natural gas with so CCS, and you can see that even in 2040, on a pathway to two degrees C world, oil and gas remains an important part of the energy mix. And um, I think it's all but one of these models still call for uh, the energy system being more than 50% of oil and gas. And so oil and gas is still an important part of the transition. Let's kind of take that a step further. So here, and let me just talk about oil, and then we'll come back to gas. So uh, the chart on the left side, the, the black line at the top, that represents the, our kind of base case outlook for oil that I showed you on the very first slide. Uh, so it's about 0.6% per year growth. 
The three diamonds represents the range of those two degree C models that I just shared with you on the prior page. So it's the range of the energy modeling forum work. Uh, and what you can see is, you know, there was one model that projected oil could be as much as 100 million barrels per day in 2040. Uh, there was other model, another one at the very bottom that projected it'd be around 55. So again, a broad range. The green shaded area represents a hypothetical supply case. What if the world stopped all new investment in oil at the end of 2017? So you know, those of you that are familiar with the oil and gas business, it is a declining business. You have to keep reinvesting in new supplies. What we're showing here is about a 7% decline per year. That, that's different around the world, it's different in the different types of fields, but a 7% is, is an average. And you can see there's a, there would be a dramatic drop off in oil supply if the world stopped investing in oil. And in fact, we, we wouldn't be able to even meet the lowest demand scenario across these two degree C scenarios. Similar message for gas, although in gas, you know, there are some scenarios that project even more gas than kind of our base case outlook. And, and those are scenarios that they're really trying to push the transition away from coal faster so they bring in much more gas early and then of course over time gas comes down but a similar story if the world had stopped investing in all gas at the end of 2017 there'd be a dramatic decline and we wouldn't be able to meet not only near-term supplies but the supplies needed long term so then one more slide just to kind of animate in so what if the world decided, okay, we'll invest in oil and gas at kind of the same high rates for just five more years, and then after five years, uh, we'll, we'll stop investment. Well, even those new investments shown kind of by the five different bands here, even those have a, a profile of declining production. And again, that, that wouldn't be sufficient to meet not only near-term demand, but, but also the longer term. So look, at some point, oil demand is going to peak and plateau and then turn around and decline. Um, in, in our own base case projections, we don't see that over this kind of next 20 year period. Uh, but, but if one of these scenarios did start to come into play uh, and, and demand started to come down, there's still sufficient oil and gas investment needed. So I wanted to share that story to then finish with this. So what, what is ExxonMobil doing? In the environment that I just shared with you, um, the need for more technology solutions, the need for oil and gas, even in a two degree C pathway, what is ExxonMobil doing? So this is actually a slide that I pulled from our um, investor relations day back in April. And so you can see how our CapEx plays out over the next two years. So in upstream, um, you know, maybe a little bit different than some of our IOC competitors, we've not backed off on CapEx uh, that much. Um, and we're still pushing through on what we think are some of the best economic resources in the world. Um, Guyana, which you know, on this page here, 5.5 billion barrels of oil equivalent. We've since announced that we think that's up to six now. Uh, so it's a it's tremendously large resource, great economics, and we're putting quite a bit of capital in there. Uh, Brazil as well, so kind of Guyana, Brazil are, are key deep water plays. And then in the Permian, uh, targeting a million barrels uh, a day by 2024. So that's a significant growth for us um, and, and a big investment. Um, but we think that that fits well with our portfolio. And then LNG. And so, you know, I went through it quickly, but with coal coming down, with an opportunity to help displace coal in developing nations, help address air quality concerns, we think there's some, some really good support for LNG projects. And so we, we've really been announcing quite a bit of capital in LNG. Then in downstream, you know, most of our investment is related to infrastructure. Um, so, so trying to help get the molecules to where the markets are needed. In our refineries, it's about um, upgrading the technology mix within our refineries. One, to handle the changing mix of oil that, that's coming out of the Permian, um, as well as to be able to meet uh, continued uh, increases in fuel standards around the world. Uh, and then chemicals, you know, I didn't go through some of our chemicals views. We've always been pretty bullish on chemicals. Um, over the years, we've continued to invest in our chemical company, and we've announced um, you know, we have 13 new facilities that are on the docket kind of over the next, uh, about out to 2025, uh, and, and we expect that'll deliver about 30% growth. So this is what ExxonMobil's investment's in. Maybe just talk just briefly about what's not on the page. So you know, what you don't see is um, we're not putting a lot of capital into wind and solar. Um, you know, even though I mentioned we think there's big growth there. Uh, in our base energy outlook, we do talk about that in parts around the world where the renewable resources are good, we think renewables are heads up competitive with coal and gas. 
Uh, but for ExxonMobil, um, our approach to this market has been let's leverage our corporate uh, electricity demand and turn those into PPAs and let other developers who have much better capability in, in developing wind and solar projects. So we're leveraging our balance sheet, our electricity demand to help pull through and we were one of the largest buyers of corporate PPAs last year. Okay, so that, that's um, the, the ExxonMobil view of the world and we'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. There you go. Great, great. Thanks, Chris. It's a great way to tee up a more focused uh, discussion on the Permian Basin. I don't know if we're getting through here on the, on the slides. Are. Uh oh. Great. Sorry. We lost it when we had to reboot something. Sorry. Our IT support is not in there. Oh, are you back there? Calvin? I'm sorry, we seem to have lost our ability to uh, get this on the screen. Sorry, Mark. No worries. Here. Yeah, your keyboard's different. Here. Yep, that's what I thought, too. That's, I don't see the view there. Yeah. I think you, when you were right clicking here, can you duplicate the view? Range icons, icons to grid. No, that's just the view of the. Yeah. And the screen resolution is not it. Sorry, we seem to have lost the ability to get the resolution up here again with the, with the PowerPoint okay. or with the, with the PDF rather. Right. Which one is it, Ryan? Uh, this one here. Showed me, but yeah, no, that's not that's what's not working. Okay, well, I'll fix that. We well, can fix that. Is it this one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, I finally got a round of applause. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, giving you, a, a, as Mark said, a deep dive into the uh, Permian Basin, but recognizing the uh, desire to get to q and I'm, I'm not going to go too deep. Um, but for those of you who are not familiar with the Permian, uh, the, it's, a, it's a legacy oil and gas field that's been producing for, for decades, um, but it's, it's probably the quintessential example of the redevelopment of the energy industry in the United States. And really, over the course of the last uh, seven to ten years, uh, the resource has been basically proven up as in, in a redeveloped scenario using uh, horizontal uh, development. And uh, it is now producing in excess of, of production that you see in the Guar field in Saudi Arabia when you consider the two sub-basins in the Permian, the Midland Basin and the Delaware Basin. Um, Pioneer Natural Resources, my company, operates exclusively in the Midland Basin. We have close to 700,000 acres there. Uh, we've been a legacy operator in the basin, either through Pioneer or our predecessor companies for decades and have been uh, fortunate enough to help participate in the, uh, in the charge to really redevelop this critical resource uh, for the United States. Um, this is a log that really gives you some a uh, picture of how you would look at the Permian in relation to some of the other shale plays in the United States. Uh, it highlights the uh, Midland and Delaware basins that I mentioned earlier, and it also shows some of the other uh, shale basins in the United States, the Eagle Ford, the Niobrara, which is uh, the Marcellus up in, in, uh, in, in the East Coast, the Bakken, and the Marcellus. Um, so looking at these, when you look at 
the indications of hydrocarbon, it really highlights for you what the resource potential is in the Permian. And breaking out, broken out in this, uh, in this pie chart, it shows the division between uh, some of the key zones that we are producing out of today in both, uh, in both the Delaware and the Midland Basins. And what I would tell you is the learning curve, while we're still on it, um, is definitely maturing. And that's one of the points I want to, I want to cover in some of my other slides. And we're now uh, truly moving into a mode where we're in a much more of a manufacturing mode, which happens to be coinciding with the time period where investor pressure for the entire industry um, is, is focused on cash flow generation and, uh, and developing a balanced model of not only funding your growth through cash flow, but also developing a free cash flow model and returning some of that uh, cash flow to shareholders, which has been a theme for a number of years really since the downturn in 2014. But the one thing that has changed uh, is the investment community is really rewarding those companies who are adopting that model and punishing those companies who are not. This shows you the growth that we've seen from the Permian Basin. It's been a substantial contributor to the United States exceeding 12 million barrels per day of production. Uh, and it continues to grow. Um, I'll show you a slide in a few minutes that will really highlight why we believe that trend is going to uh, slow down, that you won't see the same kind of growth rate that we've seen in the basin uh, over the past few years. And some of it has to do with uh, capital discipline, and some of it has to do with the, just the maturation of the field. One of the hot topics uh, for, for all of us in the Permian Basin is the development strategy and how we prosecute our plans with our acreage. And this is a lesson Pioneer learned many years ago as we were uh, starting to develop the resource. One of the benefits that we have uh, with the expansive acreage position that we have is that we are not inventory constrained. Uh, so we are able to develop the maximum uh, spacing patterns and completion techniques to be able to develop the resource in an, in an economically, capitally efficient fashion. And that's really what the point of this slide is, is when you look at our spacing patterns, we're typically spacing our wells uh, between 800 and 900 feet, um, whereas some of, some of the other peer companies have been down state spacing and seeing a degradation in the performance of their wells. Uh, we believe over time uh, that the proper prosecution of development in the field is going to be adopting wider spacing patterns. But also part of, the, part of the trick is not only as you're adopting these spacing patterns, but as you're going vertically to different levels of producing in the, in the field, is to time out the, the, the time that you bring that production online and also keep in mind vertical spacing as well. And it's very much driven by not only what basin you're in, whether it's the Midland or Delaware basin, but it's also driven by what particular area of the basin you're in and what zone you're in. And, and for a while, we were publishing uh, our various completion designs and our spacing techniques, but we found it to be so localized that there's really not one single recipe. Uh, one of the other factors that's occurred over the last few years in the industry is the advancement of completion designs and really uh, not only recognizing the benefits of running a seven to 10,000 foot lateral as you drill the well, but also the spacing patterns on how you complete those wells, what, what your, your frack distances are, and also what completion designs you use. And, and that's where the industry, again, has refined, and you will see, as, as you see in this well productivity chart, over the years, the time period that as, as we and other companies have proven up the most economically efficient way to complete our wells, you've seen an increase in well productivity. Some of those advancements are now, are now starting to level off, as you've seen in this slide. You see, as years go on, diminishing marginal returns, and you're going to continue to see that as the field gets developed. So some of the inclination and in growth because of advancement in completion designs and an understanding of spacing is going to level off over time while the growth will still continue. The other part of the uh, driver in the Permian, and when you look at this in relation to some of the other uh, plays, shale plays in the United States, is driving down uh, the break-even costs. And that's been a major story when you look at what's happened over the last five years. And those break-evens have occurred, uh, have been reduced through a variety of, of factors. One is driving down service costs. 
Uh, two is an improving, uh, improving productivity of wells. But probably one of the biggest drivers, and we've certainly seen this in our operation uh, this year and in previous years, is really improving the efficiency of the drilling and completion so that you're reducing your cycle times, reducing your costs, bringing your wells on in a more economically efficient fashion. And I do believe there's more upside to that as time goes on, but I think that upside is going to have to be driven by some technological changes in the equipment we use. Uh, today, we still use in our uh, pressure pumping our fracture stimulation equipment. It's still basically equipment design that dates back to really the 60s and 70s. And I believe um, as time goes on and the service industries are capable of capitalizing their, their frac fleets, there will be opportunities to improve the design of that equipment. One of the challenges in doing that today is the pressure on margin with the service companies and their inability to basically reinvest capital in R&D. But I believe as, as you see the environment uh, demand uh, uh, more capital go in that you'll see opportunities where there will be some technological improvements that will further improve cycle times. But using the equipment design that we have today, the rigs, the frac fleets, uh, we are seeing diminishing marginal returns for companies such as ours who've really been focused on driving down efficiency. So I mentioned the slowing productivity gains. This slide really highlights uh, what you'll see across all of the shale plays in a variety of degrees. Um, you see a substantial increase in productivity over the years. Uh, some of that driven off of uh, improvement in uh, completion designs, improvement in efficiency, and some of it driven on just sheer knowledge on what's the best way to uh, space and complete the wells in a, in a multi-zone uh, basin like the Permian. Uh, so this really kind of bears up my point that uh, you will see some uh, productivity gains uh, slowing down unless there's another major technological breakthrough uh, over the next few years. And again, this really uh, highlights the point that um, from our perspective, we expect to see a growing, a, a slowing of growth uh, from U.S. production uh, through a combination of both the uh, um, uh, decreasing marginal returns or uh, less fast marginal returns on productivity, but also uh, the fact that you've got a number of macro uh, situations in the capital markets today that is that is restricting capital going into uh, oil and gas development in basins like the Permian. As I mentioned earlier, uh, a significant amount of uh, emphasis from the investment community on public companies. Uh, and, and returning capital to shareholders and, and developing a free cash flow model. We've already seen that have an impact on the growth rates on all the public independents in the Permian Basin, as well as some of the other shale plays in the United States. Uh, in addition to that, there's a multitude of private equity funded companies uh, in the Permian and in other basins around the U.S. Uh, that are very much capitally in, capital inefficient. Uh, they were built with small management teams and designed to be basically flipped or sold into the public markets, with the public markets not really being receptive uh, to, uh, to more public companies going into the, into the E&P space. Um, what's happening with all of the private equity funded companies is they're basically having to restrain capital, uh, do more combinations to reduce their overhead, and that has the same impact of reducing production uh, as, as you see capital constrained from the private equity funding. And there are some companies that have uh, significant leverage and in a lower price environment are basically going to be forced out of business, especially those who do not have the same quality assets that can sustain a lower break even like I mentioned in my earlier slide. I wanted to highlight a few points uh, that are uh, unique uh, to Permian and unique to Pioneer's development. Uh, two of the most significant issues that we need to manage as a company and that we manage as an industry is water and uh, emissions. And uh, this slide really highlights uh, how we're approaching our water management. I thought it might be of interest to you. There's a significant amount of water that gets produced as part of our uh, operations. And uh, there's also a significant demand for use of water uh, in our pressure pumping operations in order to fracture stimulate our wells. Um, what Pioneer is doing is uh, developing a, a multitude of sources that uh, basically weans us 
almost entirely of fresh water. We still use some fresh water in our drilling operations. Um, and part of that is, is being supplied through unique arrangements that we've established with the cities of Odessa and Midland uh, to take their treated effluent and use it in our, in our fracking operations. Uh, we're in fact building a uh, effluent treatment plant for the city of Midland that will provide a 20 to 25 year source of, of water for our operation in the Midland Basin. The other aspect of, of what's going on is, is uh, responsibly addressing uh, disposal of produced water. And for years that's been injected into, into a shallow zone in the Midland Basin. Uh, there's a number of operators, including, including us, who are now injecting into deeper zones. But more importantly, using an increased amount of produced water for reuse in our pressure pumping operations. Um, so that's part of the operation. Part of what we really see is the life cycle that's pointed out on this slide. Um, the other issue is emissions management, as I mentioned. And um, we believe it's critically important for the industry to responsibly issue, manage uh, vented and flared volumes. And that's, uh, I was pointing out, we borrowed the slide from uh, Rystat that really uh, they've, they've published now for uh, for a few months that highlights the venting and flaring uh, for Permian operators. And uh, we believe it's a, of critical importance, especially in a time of sensitivity like this, that all operators are managing their emissions carefully. Um, we've been focused on this issue for years and continue to be, not only in, uh, in detecting uh, emissions through aerial monitoring uh, and working on techno technologies for continuous monitoring, uh, but also in coming up with projects to reduce uh, waste and flaring of gas. And that's something we're going to continue to focus on as a company. And we believe from a regulatory uh, and just a public policy perspective, this is the something that the industry really needs to be carefully focused on. One of the challenges associated with emissions management in the Permian is uh, basically natural gas is um, close to a waste product when you look to our revenue generation in the Permian. It's about 5% of Pioneer's revenues uh, is attributable to residue uh, natural gas. So part of the challenge is the industry will need needs to make the appropriate commitments to evacuate gas from the basin, sign up the long-term commitments to assure that pipelines are built, and also to assure that gathering and processing is built in the basin. One of the other challenges associated with uh, gas production today is uh, a lot of the economics, particularly on processing and gathering for the midstream companies who are in that business, is driven off of uh, NGL prices. And with depressed NGL prices, it's further straining the economics of develop developing that infrastructure. Um, so those are reasons that put pressure on the basin for flaring and, and, and venting when you see uh, a lack of spending on infrastructure development, but that's something the industry as a whole uh, really needs to tackle and address. One of the other issues that we face in the Permian is, is workforce, um, as well as the quality of life for our employees. It's been a, a major challenge over the years uh, in, in the, in the uh, Midland and Odessa communities, but even a bigger challenge in some of the smaller, uh, very rural communities in, uh, in the Delaware Basin, both in Texas and in New Mexico. And one of the things that the industry is doing to respond to this issue is about a year ago, the top 20 off, uh, companies operating in the Permian created a new uh, organization called the Permian Strategic Partners Partnership that is designed to focus on some of the social challenges uh, with the massive development that's going on in the Permian. Um, these include dealing with educational deficiencies, uh, the lack of, of investment in roads, which creates a significant safety problem for the basin, as well as health care and workforce development. And, and this, project, this, this entity is now up and running. Uh, we've attracted a number of other uh, members. Uh, we've committed over $100 million uh, over the next five years to address these projects and have started funding projects uh, this year. It's also our hope that we see more um, uh, truth data coming out of the Permian Strategic Partnership to better understand both the social and economic benefits attributable to having production come from not only West Texas but the United States and what that means geopolitically for the world. 
So I'll just hit a few highlights here um, to, uh, to really finish up on, on some of the benefits that I just alluded to on uh, the, uh, the shale development that's occurred in the United States as well as uh, what's happened in the Permian Basin. And, and really the first point I put on this, on this uh, slide, and I really could start and stop there, is the benefits of having cheap global energy. Uh, it would be um, interesting to find out what our energy prices would be today if uh, the U.S. had not played uh, the role that it has played over the last few years in basically developing short cycle production for the world. Um, it has clearly driven down the cost of energy uh, and it has clearly uh, driven social benefits not only in this country but around the world. Um, it also puts the United States in a very unique position in how we address our national uh, global policies, how we view ourselves uh, in relation to our Middle East policies, and also uh, what sort of economic benefits we would drive uh, for, the, for, this, uh, for this country off of the various um, incremental spending that occurs uh, from, the, from the development of the resource, not only uh, the upstream resource, but developing all of the downstream resources and uh, the eventual uh, export of, of not only oil, uh, but uh, residue natural gas through LNG and uh, all the various derivative product products from refining and marketing. Um, so it's an important issue as we continue to grapple with this concern over, uh, over hydrocarbons as a bridge fuel to also recognize the criticality of, of that bridge fuel being uh, a leavening factor in reducing the cost of energy for the world and uh, leaving the United States with uh, options that we haven't had for decades in how we address uh, national security issues and how we address energy issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And just to elaborate on that point, uh, as uh, Michael Cohen noted yesterday at lunch, um, the U.S. last year saw the biggest annual increase uh, in the production of both oil and natural gas of any country ever in the history of the planet. Um, and it didn't take $100 oil or $10 natural gas to get there. Per Magnus. Uh, thank you, Mark. And thank you, Mark, also for an excellent uh, introduction to Permian. Uh, uh, I can just confirm a couple of uh, data that you showed. You know, first of all, I would just uh, compliment you also for this uh, child weld uh, because our data also shows that you are best in uh, in the basin on on child weld. Uh, uh, no impact on, uh, on on pioneers' uh, production. So I can just confirm that. Um, well, I I will start with. Um, I will not take time to go through the conclusion. You can see that in the slides when I'm handing it out uh, later. Uh, first of all, what is going on with the, the, um, with the financing uh, side on the energy business? We are coming from, uh, if you look at offshore, how offshore project were financed, that was 80% equity, 20% uh, debt. And we are moving towards, uh, towards renewable energy, where the big energy companies uh, will, uh, will see a completely different balance sheet uh, with 90% debt financing uh, in the future. And we see shale as a kind of exercise in, in preparing for this dramatic change of, uh, of balance sheet, uh, with, with shale typically having uh, something like 50% uh, debt. Uh, for so, some small players, unfortunately, a little too much debt, but uh, in average, 50% uh, uh, has been a uh, kind of sane uh, balance sheet for, for shale players. Now, looking at since it's energy transition, uh, I think this is quite interesting to look at uh, how big these uh, wind projects, uh, when you move offshore, how big they are. So in the North Sea, Equinor is um, planning to launch a gigantic uh, offshore wind project uh, with investments of $12 billion, the Dogger Bank. I also think it's interesting to see uh, also how uh, this will, these windmills, they will be like 250 meters uh, tall and produce 12 megawatt of power. 
So it, the, these generators are actually uh, moving towards the size of hydro uh, power generators. Very large, but still this project, $12 billion, it produces, um, with the efficiency of, of uh, windmills, produces something like um, two gigawatt of power. And if you look at that in terms of barrels of oil equivalent, it is something like 30,000 barrels of oil equivalent, meaning that uh, the kind of capital intensity of such a project, uh, in, in oil we have a metrics uh, which you call capex per flowing barrel, which uh, is uh, offshore is typically around $50,000 uh, per flowing barrel. Uh, oil stands, it was up to $100,000 uh, uh, per flowing barrel. Here we are talking about something like $400,000 uh, per uh, flowing uh, barrel of oil equivalent, if you can have such a measure. But still, after 15 uh, years, these uh, windmills, they have paid down the debt and uh, then they are continuing running without any kind of uh, operational cost at all. So in the, in the long future, we think that these, uh, these kind of investments will be paid down by debt and then we will see probably lower uh, electricity uh, costs uh, across the world. Now, this is a little the same as Chris showed us. Uh, it is um, talking about the base decline and how much investments we still need in the oil and gas business uh, with different type of, uh, of oil demand forecast. Uh, the, the base decline uh, or the global average base decline is something around 12%. Meaning that if you don't drill any wells in, uh, in the fields, uh, the oil declines by 12% uh, per year. And if you, you think that uh, there will be some kind of peak, maybe around 2030, from that time in the next 10 years, uh, the base decline will take us down by 65 million barrels. Uh, of course, there will be a lot of infield drilling. Infield drilling will compensate uh, for this decline by something like 40 million barrels. But even with a uh, quite uh, uh, optimistic uh, oil demand, let's, let's call it uh, optimistic oil demand for the climate, uh, we, with, uh, with our oil demand uh, declining, uh, like we have seen in our base decline, uh, we have a base case for oil demand, which is a little more careful than Exxon uh, actually is, uh, in, uh, is uh, showing us. Uh, but still, there will be a need for 17 million barrels of new projects. Uh, and 70 million barrels, uh, if that is $100,000 per flowing barrel, we are talking about $17 trillion of dollar invested over, over 10 years after the peak uh, in, in new projects on top of infield drilling, even with... Uh, uh